Hello and welcome back to part five of the Let's Ask Max community Q&A segment. I'm joined today by none other than the people's dad, Max Ada. Yeah. How are you doing, Max? I'm doing really well. How are you doing? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. I'm excited to do this Q&A. I think people really like it. We've been getting a generous yeah. amount of questions, like very generous, and they keep getting more and more complex and more and more specific. So, um, okay. And I think people like when we kind of go off on, on tangents about the topics or the questions or the people. So we'll, we'll make sure to do that. Um, but yeah, let's dig in. Cool. Okay, so the first question is from Cooper Okihomi, um, Coop. He says, any Masters competitors using the AI that might be competing at upcoming Masters Worlds or AO in December? If so, would you have their age weight class available? Also, will Joanne be competing? I'm not sure that was the best question to start with, uh, but Pretty we'll answer Pretty pertinent to a certain thing. Uh, Joanne won't be competing, and I sh- don't know if there's any Masters going to those meets. Uh, I feel like we have a decent Masters community in in the, the app and using the app. Um, if you guys are Masters, um, you know, feel free to chime in and make it known that you're Masters because uh, it would be cool for us to get a lot more data on Masters. And we have it obviously in the app, but it would be cool to kind of collect a little community of Masters so we can actually like address the needs of Masters. If you guys are vocal about what you want in the app, uh, it's more likely to happen. Yeah, I agree. Uh, so the next question is actually from Justin, the Muffin Man, who recently PR'd his block clean by a disgusting number of kilos, eclipsing his best lift from a 4x7 at 140. So congrats, yeah. Justin. Nice uh, job. He says, are there differences in how snatch versus clean and jerks are programmed? Obviously dependent on tattoos, but aside from that, I noticed that I have higher frequency and lower session volume for clean and jerk, and clean and jerk intensity is a bit lower. Uh, so the, the intra differences for a person would just be that generally less clean and jerks are programmed, uh, simply because they're a little more fatiguing, uh, with the differences between people, it's going to be dependent on where your weaknesses are. If you have, you know, snatch weaknesses, you're going to get more snatching. If you've got clean and jerk weaknesses, you get more of those. The intensity, again, all those things are adjusted for individual differences. So. In general, you're probably seeing more lighter clean and jerks uh, in the program, and that's partly because you're probably not as strong in the snatch, and so it's giving you more snatching. I could be wrong, uh, but that would be the number one reason I would suspect somebody would get a lot less clean and jerks. Yeah, and I think because clean and jerk has uh, a stronger correlation to a strength lift, um, you would generally see that like, if you're, tr- I, I would, I would imagine that if you're doing more front squats, that also would take up a portion of kind of like the available clean and jerk work. Whereas with the snatch, you can't really make yeah. that up anywhere else. It, it could also be that people are used to training clean and jerk much heavier yeah, than so. the app is giving them. Um, you know, in general, the program probably feels to most people, I would imagine, less heavy than a lot of programs. Yeah. Um, it's it's got a a a much more normal distribution of training. I, I, I made fun of the other day for saying <laughs> that word. But the intensity should be distributed in a normal pattern where most of the volume is in like lower intensity ranges than most people I think are used to training. I feel like a lot of people train with programs that are like very heavy all the time. Yeah. Um, and you know, my experience was that moving away from that kind of training years ago, made a big impact on people's skill level, their speed qualities, technique. Uh, so, you know, obviously he did well, made a PR off the block, so hopefully yeah. that translates to the floor and, and we start to see bigger lifts from in the classic lift. But yeah, I would think that it could just be a byproduct of people expect the clean jerks to be much heavier, uh, expect to do them a lot more frequently. Um, yeah, so hard to say. Yeah, and I think, I think this question is interesting because I wonder if you were to increase the average intensity of the clean and jerks and the frequency if people would then be worried that there's too much clean and jerks and they're too heavy. So I think it's a question of, is it kind of an issue that it's not there or is it just more so like the grass is greener type thing to where if it were different, you would be wondering why it's not lighter or less frequency or less volume. Yeah. Um, Dewey, we had Dewey, uh, Dewey Tran from Max's gym. He competed and the entire, he went clean jerk 135, right? 
um, or he missed the yeah. he missed the jerk behind yeah, him. That's right. uh, but he, he, he you know he could have made one thirty five, clean one thirty easily. Yeah. Uh, he didn't touch anything over like one fifteen the whole cycle leading up. He did one day where he had a max clean, which was one forty, um, and he said that he felt great at the meet. Yeah. So you know, there's definitely yeah you know, we're looking for that the indicators that the program is doing things well in that you peak well, your performance is high, but you're not just doing the same lifts week, 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 you know, taking 130 five weeks in a row than doing yeah. 130 at the meet. Yeah. We want to see a, a ramping up of abilities because it's much easier to shift training volume and load when you're training sub-maximally and move that higher than it is to go from beating your head against the wall to backing off and then coming back and doing it, so. Yeah, I, I think a lot of my best meets happened when there were like big jumps from week to week leading up in like my clean and jerks versus I did heavy clean and jerks for four weeks and they were around the same weight. They all kind of felt the same. Yeah. And then that's more so like, I don't think there's gonna be a like an overshoot here and I'm gonna yeah. get much better. It's more so like, I just need to not yeah. suck the day of the meet. Yeah. Whereas, you know, the, the like you said, the sessions where maybe they're a little lighter, a little more volume, maybe more technically focused. And then you have like this very extreme ramping up to the meat and then suddenly you just pull something out of your ass that you couldn't imagine. Can I say ass? You just did. Uh, I said it twice. Uh, you pull something out that you couldn't imagine doing. I think that's a much more rewarding feeling. And I imagine that's what his 140 was like from the blocks, where it was just yeah. this huge PR, probably on plan. The program just told him to max out and see where he's at. And then he, he really yeah. came out with something special. Yeah. So. And again, you know, something to remember too, the, the system is ever evolving, right? So in a year, what, what people get given might be very different based on the cumulative data we have right. and the way the system evolves. Yeah, cool. So the next question is from AP Vasquez. She says, would like to hear about suggestions for warm up progression for the first exercise and then once going from snatches to cleans, how should the warm up be? She gives a couple examples. She said her concern is starting at too low a percent, creating too much exhaustion or not warming up well enough and then struggling with the first percentage working set. So I would say the simplest solution to this is you're probably going to establish a pretty consistent, like you need after your general warm up, after doing what you need, you know, to get your body warm and you've taken the bar and you've warmed up, you know, your joints to make sure you can do the movement. Um, we talk a little bit about, and we've had many conversations about the idea of like a primer. Yeah. Uh, so you might use your warm up sets, right. let's say three sets of warm ups, you know, maybe four, all, you know, between one to three reps, relatively light intensities. Basically, it's going to be like, 50, 55, 60, or 50, 60, 70 percent. Um, maybe a little bit smaller jumps in there, just depending on we, who you are. But those warm ups can basically just be three to four sets of a primer movement that's similar to the move you're going to do or augments your skill practice of the move you're going to do. So maybe it's like muscle snatches if you're doing power snatches, or you know, there's a, there's a million of them. But using that sort of first three to four sets to get to your work weights as a primer to sort of improve your skills so you're ready to do that, those work sets with the best technique possible. I wouldn't say it's super necessary to do the same rep sets that you're doing as your work sets. If you're doing triples in your work sets or fours, you don't have to do threes or fours on the way up. Um, it's gonna be dependent on the type of person. Some people just have huge work capacities and it doesn't bother them at all. Some people, you know, it's just gonna eat into their ability to train well. The, the most important thing is that the warm-up sets are just that, they're warm-ups. You're not turning it into a second workout leading up to it. You don't wanna do nine warm-up sets and then try to do nine doubles after that. Uh, it's just not necessary. But, yeah, you have to give yourself wiggle room to feel yeah. better. Cause I, right. I hear that it's like, well, it didn't feel right. So I just kept taking it and it's like, that's fine. But you also yeah. have to imagine that you're gonna get better throughout the workout because you're gonna be able to make corrections. You're gonna be able to feel out the weight when you're taking straight sets. You're gonna be able to get a little more dialed in. Um, you know, you, you kind of change your mindset a little bit when you're at work sets versus just warming up. Yeah. Um, so I would say my thought kind of mirrors uh, what Max says. I think work capacity is like a very flexible thing and you can you can improve it a lot. Um, so if you, you kind of take an approach that, you know, I, I've thought about what, which is, Whatever you're doing, just kind of warm it up incrementally. Don't change it too much. Some people will go from doing singles to doing sets of four. And yeah. I think while that's like really efficient, it just makes that first set really like a yeah, shock. And then maybe you're trying to ease into it. You have two or three sets. 
something that's not super great. So I would think about where you're at, how flexible your work capacity is or how, how good it is now. Use that to kind of guide your warmups. But I think a movement primer that maybe is like a little higher rep or just kind of the same number of reps as your work sets and then just breaking into your work sets with the, the normal movement after you've warmed up, like Max said, the part of the skill that you want to focus on. Um, and, and a lot of this takes just a little bit of thought. It's, it's not something you can really systematize, um, even though we probably will at some point, and, and we probably will be able to adjust the, the primers that are in the system or drills. But yeah. for now, I would just kind of play it, play around with it. And for the person specifically asking this, I don't think you'll get too tired yeah. warming up with whatever the rep or set scheme is for the, for the day. Um, so I'd probably shoot for that versus, you know, just throwing a dart in the dark, as I like to say, and warming up with singles up to a set of five. Yeah. Okay, so Stephen D. Armstrong, a uh, prolific poster and serial memer, mm. says, following on the Muffin Man's question, if we notice the same thing, could you provide general suggestions as to approximate percent weight to add or subtract to the first set? Recommendations as to adding or removing sets. General guidelines as to how to adjust programming and the types of feedback from the lifter that would tell you guys as coaches that we should experiment with these changes. The app is flexible and can accommodate easily, but I think it would be helpful to discuss. Um, so basically I think what he's saying is like, if the clean and jerks are generally too light, too low volume, is there a recommendation you would make at large to help people better use the program? So at large is difficult to answer because, you know, it just depends on, it depends on each person's individual reason for having, having those sessions built like that. Right. Uh, what I would say is if you feel the sessions are too light right now, then you can increase by, I would say 5% is a good number to start at mm -hmm. and see how those sessions go, but give it a little bit of time, right? If you start going 5%, and you're like, oh, it's still too light. And after two weeks, you, you know, or not two weeks, after a few days, you bump up another 5% all the time. Like you're probably gonna run into a situation where you've increased the weight a bunch and then quickly you'll run into lifts that are not as good, right? Or, or missing or just too heavy. Uh, so I'd say if you do feel the need to increase the intensity, then you know, add about 5% to, to the weight that's starting the session and then, and then take it from there. The app will go up from there. Uh, as far as adding sets, removing sets, think of this feature as, as you know, listening to your body. One right. thing that in weightlifting I think is a skill that every lifter has to have is the ability to tell, you know, where uh, where a session that's good can be extended and where a session that's not good needs to be shut down. Right. Um, you know, you, you just have to sort of develop that innate feel for that kind of thing. And with those features like add and remove set, what we're trying to do is give athletes the ability to capture some of that, that the app's not capturing right now. Uh, you know, if the app is, the algorithm has given you the wrong amount of volume, you know, whether it's off a little bit or off a lot, adding sets to your sessions when you feel like, hey, I've just, I just cruised through four doubles and I, I feel great and everything is still highly rated, I'm gonna keep going, add a few more. Yeah. That's, that's what we want to know. The app wants to know this information. If you also feel like, hey, I got nine doubles and at six, I'm just smoked and these are not great. I'm gonna just stop these last three. That's also very good information. So think of it as like a coach would have you do, right? If you're in the gym and you're training and you're doing well or you're not doing so well, the coach is gonna shut things down or say, hey, let's do another set or that looks really great. Like add another one, right. or, you know, let's, let's expand on that. Think of it as a way to sort of train the system to understand where volumes may be a little bit off for you or where your fitness level is improving faster than expected, right? Uh, so you can kind of use it that way. And then with the actual increase in intensity stuff, be very cautious with that because it can quickly get, you know, that it's gonna add weight a lot. Of, it wants to add weight a lot of times in a session. So if you bump that up really fast, and then you're suddenly going from like, well, my first set's great, and then they just get worse and worse after that, but at least it's heavy, that's not helping you. No, I think that's a great answer. Um, very fleshed out. I think the only points I'd reiterate is if you're making progress, there's probably nothing wrong with it. Right. So like the question about is the clean and jerk too light or too low volume, if you're making progress in it, it's perfect. And then if you're not making progress, it's like, yeah, then how can you make those adjustments um, to help facilitate it, knowing that this is kind of an ever evolving yeah. coach program product that you can create to best fit your needs. 
Um, so if you can do that and you, and you keep that in mind, I think it'll, it'll kind of take shape to what it needs to be. So Raw Feels says, ditto about Snatch versus Clean and Jerk programming. If I had to throw a number out, I feel like I do two times as many snatches as I do Clean and Jerk. My snatches have become more consistent, but at the detriment of heavy cleans. Yesterday, four snatch triples at 70%, four clean and jerk singles at 80%, and it's peak week one. Yeah, so you're probably getting a lot less. You probably have, in general, it's it's always gonna bias towards a little more snatching, uh, just because clean and jerks are generally harder. Um, and it probably is giving you maybe a little bit less because your snatch is relatively stronger, or sorry, your clean jerk is maybe relatively weaker. No, stronger. Your, your clean jerk is stronger, so you're getting maybe one less session there. Yeah. Uh, you do have the option, there is the feature to add the sessions of snatch or clean jerk to, right. your, to your plan. Um, obviously, if you've got four or five days of training and you're doing two clean jerk workouts and you want to do more, you can increase the session count uh, and then that feedback is given as well. Um, so again, the same thing. Also, with situations like in peaking, you're gonna see smaller workouts exist where you get something like four singles at 80 or 85 or whatever, 90% versus in like a, a general phase of training where you might see much larger workouts. Yeah, that's right. Um, Hugo00 says, I noticed on the app it's possible to alter rep sets uh, alter reps sets. How important is it to stick to the written programming as is? I would suggest sticking to it as, as close as you can. Uh, you're definitely welcome to make adjustments there. There'll be components of what happens with the, the reps per set later on that, that are planned into the, the, the system later. Um, so, you know, right now, like making big adjustments to that a lot of times, like if you're constantly changing every workout, it's gonna be weird. <laughs> You're probably gonna teach the system some very weird stuff. Uh, I would say stick to it as close as you can. I would generally only adjust the reps per set if, you know, for whatever reason, you feel like you, you need to dial it back a lot. Yeah, I think starting out, it's kind of like w when you're trying to lose or gain weight, um, yeah. you pick a calorie amount and you don't start adjusting that before you've even had that for like a few weeks or a few months because you're, you don't know what the effect is gonna be. So with a program, you just kind of assume it as is, it's a best guess, and then you make decisions based off of what did or didn't work. Um, but like having no no result to make a decision off of is just gonna be, again, yeah. kind of like blindly guessing. Um, and we're, we're both probably in agreement with this that we're probably no smarter than the app at deciding what someone needs initially. Right. And, and, and probably not at making adjustments either. So. Um, I just let it do that, and then whatever adjustments need to be made later on, you can you can work to do that. Alexander N says, "What are the advantages, disadvantages, training effects of block snatches and cleans from above, above the knee versus from the hang versus full movement with a pause at the knee, and how good can one of these exercises work as a substitute for the other?" It's an interesting question because we literally just were just <laughs> talking about this before yeah. the before this video. Um, I think the most optimistic answer to these kind of questions is that they have a significantly greater effect at developing some qualities and in reinforcing the technique of some phases and yeah. positions, and then potentially even developing extra strength in those phases or in those certain positions. The most pessimistic answer would be that they are simply novel versions of the classic snatch or clean. <laughs> Um, I tend to believe that the answer is probably closer to the middle of those, mm -hmm. that there's a, there's definitely a, an isolated benefit of those particular exercises. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's obvious in things like block lifts versus hang lifts. You know, if you do five triples of hang snatches at 80% and five triples of block snatches at 80%, your back's going to be a lot more tired yeah. after the hang lifts, right? Um, to what degree that has a significant impact on low back strength or the positions there is kind of tough to know. Um, but definitely there's, there's particularly different, you know, effects from those things. Same with pause lifts. Um, you know, we just talked about this, like the magnitude of the, like the amount of time you actually pause right. on a pause snatch, you know, the amount of volume you do of those, is it, is it significant enough to develop strong 
you know, uh, effect of, of isometric, you know, strength training in your low back? Uh, it's debatable, yeah. right? Yeah. Probably not. Um, does it offer a novel experience that, you know, does it offer some technical, uh, like tactile feel where you learn a little bit more about that position and you feel more comfortable there? And there's some kind of component of skill practice or skill development from it? You know, probably so. So it's a, it's a tough question to answer on like a very particular level. Um, in the, the way that I shift my thinking more now in training, which is by probability, like is the probability that doing these exercises going to improve certain phases of the lift? The probability is higher than zero that it will, right? Uh, so it's, it's worth doing um, versus, you know, the negative impact of potentially having no variation in training right. and only doing the classic lifts. I think there's a benefit enough to justify those exercises. Yeah, I, I would I would agree with Max, and I would say that the things that are mainly driving the training effect here would be the weight on the bar, and then also the duration of time spent in those positions. Yeah. So if you're thinking of pauses, I would say you have to. Yeah, I I would opt as like a pause in the knee for a more technical option, but again, I wouldn't say it's like building a lot of strength. And then I would say if you're doing pulls or deadlifts, you like really overload the position in the pause and make sure it's like a dang good pause. Yeah. Like spend as much time there as possible. And then uh, I think a lot of the pause works more coordination. With the block work, I think that is good from a coordination standpoint. And I think maybe removing a little bit of extra work. Yeah. Um, so I think it's just kind of a skill thing. Maybe there's like rate of force development and you're getting a little bit quicker. But I think trying to then bridge that to the full lift, I don't know if that has a significant effect. Uh, yeah. With the hang lifts, though, I think Max is spot on. That's going to provide much more training stress. And if you're doing sets of three, sets of four, pull plus, and doing all these different complexes from the hang, it is significantly more difficult. Yeah. Um, I'd say that's probably going to give you like the biggest you know stress response. And then the other two are just going to be more coordination. And I think like pulls from the hang. I remember when we did the no foot pulls from the hang. Like those were really tough, but I actually liked the way it felt yeah. uh, and the way I felt like I was able to kind of move the bar. So I would think more in terms of if I want to do something mechanical, it's going to be with pulls and deadlifts for these variations, kind of at maximal loads. And then if I want a coordination or like technical effect, it's going to be the actual lifts with like the right amount of time spent in those positions. But again, can you wash that all out with like sets of three or sets of four in the classics and doing those really well? Maybe, but it's not quite as fun. Uh, yeah, I would also say that there's definitely an impact in those lifts in in the ability to to transfer those skills, right? Okay. I think I, I think it's probably underrated that like yeah. things. I mean, like like it's very easy for someone to do a big block snatch or something yeah. and lever themselves under the bar and scoop it up and like it just changes the dynamic of the movement. Um, and so like there's there's relatively little transference. We also know that the like from research that's been done on these lifts, there's lesser correlation between your block snatch and your hang snatch to your classic lift, right? And it's a small amount, but yeah. but we do know there's just a, statistic, a statistical difference between that. Whereas like if you have someone do a lot of hang snatches, they're going to come away from it yeah. being better at, at controlling the bar and, and the strength of their back is gonna come up a lot. I think you see it a lot when people have major discrepancies. Someone has really strong legs and a relatively weak back, like a weak low back. They have a hard time staying in position over the bar. Hang lifts will definitely have a significant impact on that. So, yeah, I would agree with that, and uh, I, I would say too that a lot of the ability to do the movement correctly so that it has carryover is on the athlete, and a yeah. lot of the ability to sequence that into the full lift is on the coach. So I think if you can combine those two to where the person executes it properly and the coach is able to take that and turn it into a big lift from the floor at a competition, you kind of have a pretty strong duo there. Yeah. Um, but those things aren't super easy. Otherwise, we would just block snatch and hang snatch PRs and then yeah. turn that around for a competition PB. Okay, so Jason G. Wolf uh, has his uh, question that he asked said, saying, Stumbling my way into weightlifting as my primary objective later in life, he's 36 years old, what would you consider to be clear goals to hit in terms of relative level to consider someone legitimate? Of course, this, subject, this is subjective, and anyone who trains and competes in weightlifting is awesome regardless of total. I might disagree with that. 
uh, but what is your subjective thought? My long shot goal is to qualify for nationals in the open category. Not sure it will happen, but shooting for it. And the chance Max will think I'm cool then. P.S. Josh is not legit until he hits a 290 total. Okay. Although Philosophical Weightlifting has earned the title of my favorite podcast, Sorry, Seth. Wow. There's a lot in there. Throwing some serious shots at people in there. <laughs> uh, so what makes him legitimate as someone who came into weightlifting later in life? <laughs> what's what's your Sorry. opinion? What's um, your opinion? Honestly, I think you're legitimate if you stay in weightlifting. Yeah. Like, like that's the big thing. The numbers are kind of something that is a, a lot of it based on talent, a lot of it based on circumstance and, and coaching and ath like baseline athleticism. But if you stick with it for four, five, ten years, like I think those people are legit. I mean, legitimate is such a relative term. Like, if you're in the four, you know, the three Olympic gold medals category, is everyone else outside of that category not legitimate? Right. Like, if you're the, you know, if you're the only person in your family that's ever worked out and you, yeah. you know, got in good shape and you're healthy and you snatch your body weight, like, yeah. is that legit? Like, what's, it's such a relative term that, like, my, estimation of it is based on the person it's yeah, like that's right. you know if somebody in my opinion if somebody who who improves themselves above and beyond what they thought they could do then that would be someone who's legitimate yeah. right so if somebody comes in and they you know they, they've proved themselves they can do something that was hard that they didn't expect they could do or achieves a level of success that you know is beyond the scope of what they thought uh, initially that would be a legitimate you know a legitimate person right obviously if your expectations are extremely low and you know, it's probably a little easier to get to that point but yeah I mean if you if you come into the sport with you know with with some expectations you can do something and you exceed those and you work hard towards it that would be legitimate in my opinion yeah and I think I think we reframe this slightly and we focus on the technical aspect of the lift if you come into the sport having never done it later in life and you become so technically proficient that we would watch and say like, oh, there's not a lot wrong there. It looks like a really great snatch or really great clean and jerk. I think that's, you know, doing as much as you can because yeah. I've seen a lot of people who are maybe limited by like the positions they can get in or just like how coordinated they are or how strong they are, but they move really well and they're really deliberate and careful about all their, all, all the things they do with their training. Like to me, again, that's, like someone who, who really cares and is legitimate and is, is a weightlifter. Um, so I, numbers, that one's always yeah. kind of weird. Uh, that's probably dependent on a lot more than we want to give credence to. Um, but yeah, just stick with it, see how far you can go, and we'll decide if it's legitimate later on. Yeah. So Demuffin Man double dips with another question. He says, can you talk about how the weight is adjusted by RIR ratings on squats and presses? Uh, there's a target rating for sets based on phase and, and microcycle. Um, and so, you know, basically it's going to try to keep you within that range as you, as you train, right? So as you get closer to the end of the, the block, those RIR ratings will go down. So the number will get a little bit closer to limit. Uh, and then as you get, you know, further from that, it's going to be a little bit higher. And then each phase is a little bit more specific as to what RIR is planned. Yeah, sounds great. Pretty much straightforward. <laughs> yeah, very straightforward. Um, SLT says, can you guys talk about the peaking strategy for the AI? So the peaking strategy is the same as basically any other peaking strategy, is that it's going to try to taper you the last week. Uh, currently, the peaking strategy, the peaking block, is really something we've been uh, retooling behind the scenes. Uh, it's a little bit light, and it is a little bit... Uh, it does some things that we want to fix and make adjustments to. So look for an update that's going to come soon. I don't know exactly when. I can never say when they're coming because, uh, you know, it's not the actual building of it. It's yeah. the planning and figuring out how to build it. Uh, but yeah, there'll be, there'll be some adjustments to peaking. But overall, it's the same strategy as, as we would employ as a coach is to, you know, basically have a, a weak taper. There'll be attempts at like near openers, 90% range. Uh, you know, about seven days out for most people, uh, but that's pretty straightforward as far as peaking goes. Yeah, and the peaking strategy is such a, it's a big thing to get into, so I think what Max said is perfect. Um, yeah, and, yeah. and I, I guess if you need to make some micro adjustments, week of, day of, 
uh, within the block. Like, yeah. I'm sure, I'm sure if you feel like you can go up in PR, you do that. And if you feel like you're kind of beat down and need a little more time between big sessions, like you can probably adjust to manage that too. So Alexander N says, it would be interesting to know which exercises are going to be added soon and something like an expected timeline of new features. By the way, there's a list of all exercises. Is there a list of all exercises the AI could program? Josh has seen a list of <laughs> complexes the AI could program. Yeah. And what was it, like 12,000 lines? That's insane. Um, so there's a lot of po possibilities, right? Uh, there will definitely be more exercises incorporated. Uh, like the entirety of the pulling, like pulling suite of movements uh, is still is still going to be added. We have some pulls obviously in there, but there's a, another probably close to twelve thousand lines of pull comp pulling and pulling variations, and I guess you call them complexes. Right. Um, that'll be that'll be incorporated. The reason pulls were not really heavily like we were like throwing them in right away is because a lot of times pulling volume can just become trash volume that like isn't serving anyone any purpose uh, and it's, ex it's exhausting. And to make sure that we were getting closer to the right level with the actual lifts that matter most, uh, we opted to make pulls something that was not insignificant but less emphasized. Uh, you know, it's very easy to just throw tons of pulls into a program and have them not do much at all except make you tired. And then yeah, the list is the list is huge. <laughs> yeah, which is cool. I think as they're building out the exercise list, or the complex list, and all the options for people with different needs, it's just going to give such a comprehensive, complete yeah. product, and it's going to make training really fun. Everyone's going to have like uh, exercises and complexes specific to them, specific to the phase, specific to like all of these things. And it's just gonna be more comprehensive than I think anything else really could be. The goal too, you gotta remember, the goal is not to have the most exercises. The goal is to have the right choices right. for you. Right. So most of what we do is try to create systems that, you know, algorithms that basically find ways to pick better options for people because we don't have the luxury of like watching someone do a lift and say, oh, you need this. Right. We have to use a lot of other you know, mechanisms to figure out what are potentially better choices. Uh, and so that process is way more, <laughs> it's way more difficult yeah. to get that right. But that's our goal is getting you know, the highest probability exercise for you based on what we think is most likely going to be a problem you have. Yeah, awesome. So Robert Gronland, says in previous programs and programming textbooks i've gotten the impression that in the tapering peaking phase you want more specificity so as you approach the comp you mainly train the full lifts i'm in the second week of the peaking phase now and will compete in the european masters next week i'm surprised by how much non-specific lifting the ai is programming last week and this week i still have a lot of powers hang and block variations pause jerks etc also several days with three reps in the snatch why is that programmed only days before the comp? So, as far as the actual exercise selections, uh, there could be some bugs with blocks. Uh, we've been working to get the blocks. We shouldn't program blocks in peaking. Uh, so that would be the one thing that I would be surprised there. Uh, I watched Nino Pizzolatto snatch triples from the hang four days before he competed. Yeah. Uh, that's not unusual to see people do variations leading up to competition, especially in the like the traditional sort of Soviet model of programming, uh, variations are still used, you know, close to the meat. They're not just doing snatch and clean trick every single day. Uh, powers are pretty high specificity. Powers you'll see basically every day, or not every day, every week in a program, basically from start to finish almost. So not super unusual. Um, if it was just snatch and clean trick singles going to the competition, that would probably be fine and suffice, but the system still has a lot more variation allowable in those things. And like we said, our goal is to be less wrong as we go. So adding in more filters to change these things to give people a level of specificity that's comfortable to them. You know, as long as we're not, as long as we're not in a situation where we're overfitting something to certain people that don't want it to be a certain way. We want a system that works properly uh, even if it gives some variation. And in my experience, you know, even with athletes I coach, like we had variations up in through the last week, mm -hmm. you know, 
Yeah. Yeah, and you have to remember that training theory isn't training, in, it's not training practice, right? Right. So training theory would state that you increase specificity as much as possible and then you manage the fatigue of that specificity. But uh, like plenty of coaches, plenty of athletes have found that that's not entirely the case and you make PRs and work capacity blocks or in strength blocks or you and you get worse in a peaking block and it's not that like the block or the the focus is the thing that made you worse or better it's just like the way you trained was more conducive to getting better sometimes that means slightly lower intensities as we've talked about with the cleaning jerks sometimes that means having differences in volumes um, exercise selection is huge and we just did an entire podcast with Mike Tashir on the philosophical yeah. weightlifting podcast you can listen to that where we talked about peaking. I've done other podcasts with Mike where he's discussed his approach to peaking and how sometimes you just have exercises or rep and set schemes or like average intensities where things just kind of take off and you yeah. want to run that back. So I think having a little more variety, uh, it does a few different things based on how you, like what lens you use, but specificity only matters in so much as it's like the best practice the the most transferable practice and that actually pans out um which isn't always the case but it it's not to say that's always wrong either yeah it's interesting too because you look at specificity like we we may be splitting hairs on a lot of things yeah like if you were doing sets of eight in the back squat the week before the meet definitely violating specificity yeah um i've seen the chinese team doing maximum deadlifts days before competition. Yeah. Something that, you know, all research and literature would tell us is not specific to weightlifting. Right? The speed the speed of movement of those lifts and the the just everything about it is not gonna transfer super well. We see them winning tons yeah. of medals. So, you know, it's like the difference between a hang snatch or a triple might be significantly less than what yeah. we think from a specific you know specificity standpoint. How far down the spectrum is that? versus like, yeah, everything is basically here in specificity, yeah. but you know, if you get way far away, yeah, for sure you'd be violating it. One, I think, you know, the ability of a coach to zoom out and say there are a lot of things going on during a training block. You can't just say well, this one exercise or this one rep set scheme because it's influenced by like training at large. Right. Because muscles just work to contract. They work to contract and contract in specific ways, but it doesn't say like, oh, this is a snatch rep. I'll right. count it as a snatch rep this is like a snatch rep push press, I'll count it as a snatch. Like it just kind of doesn't figure that way. And I think um, having a more comprehensive look saying like, what does programming generally look like? How does that work out? And just finding what's worked and revisiting that versus, you know, trying to be like super fine and granular with all the decisions. I think, uh, I think that's your best bet. But yeah. that's, that's from a coaching standpoint. Okay, so Queen My Pawn says what do you guys think about incomplete snatch reps people say it's to set up better to focus on the pull speed or because they don't want to focus on the leg hypertrophy and elite weightlifters don't complete their snatches look at lou i don't think that that works for me and i always go for a full snatch and incompletes don't count for me is this reasonable i'll just say i've seen this guy left he's posted in the the form quite a bit and he's you know, more on the beginner intermediate side of things. So I would say just do full snatches, like finish all of your reps, uh, make sure they're all high quality. But Max, what do you generally say to people who ask I would this? say if you can snatch more than one and a half times your body weight, you can do, you can drop the bar. Yeah. Until you get to that point, you should stand up all your lifts. It's just, yeah. The argument is sort of weak. Yeah. to like yeah you don't need the extra time if you do you need to be in better shape <laughs> right i think that's the, i think that's it's always like, the point is like people yeah. want to work backwards instead of working forwards it's yeah, like well, i'm yeah. not in good shape so i i should save yeah. myself and it's like or you could just become in yeah. like, get in better shape and then do more um yeah okay so uh we have i think we have two oh this is the last question so ori says can you talk about some technical details about how the ai works and this is like five this is a questions. huge question. Uh, so, so maybe we'll just uh, fire can, through these. Yeah. Yeah. How does it use, so we'll start, we'll just go one at a time. <laughs> this <laughs> is a mega big question. Yeah. Um, how does we already it, discuss the ratings. We did. So how does it discuss the ratings from the user? Um, are there some neural network involved? Uh, based on this forum, several. 
Uh, several users seem to get the same lift variation on the same similar days. There's some kind of manually written team program with a set of exercises for each week, and the volume and intensity is adjusted. What internal parameters does the app calculate <laughs> estimate and use? For this instance, is a, this is a, an essay. Yeah. Do you analyze all data to fine tune your models, or does it seem like that's something in the future? Some interesting future plan for improvements. I think this is the probably, enthusiasm is great. Yeah, it's a very big question. <laughs> there's a lot of like really technical stuff in there. Yeah. I would say that there there's logic that's used to write programs and those programs are specific to the person, the phase, and a few other things. Yeah. I mean, I feel like these questions have all very much been answered in a lot of ways. Yeah. Not that I'm trying to gloss over it, it's just a lot of it's a very dense question. Yeah. Um, the thing I will say is that yeah, so, I mean, as far as, like, the inner workings of the actual app itself, uh, every time I answer a question like that, I know I'm not answering it properly, and Daniel <laughs> is cringing, so I don't want to answer that stuff. Uh, as well, like, we have long-term plans with the app and what, what our intent is to do with that. Uh, you know, I actually spoke to uh, a, a CEO of another company, uh, and he had some great information as far as, like, scaling a product like this. And you know our long-term intent, what to do with machine learning and neural network uh, stuff, is definitely in the works, and that's that's our plan long-term with certain things. But as far as like you know, like describing the complete inner workings of the system, like I spend all day doing that with Daniel, and yeah. so it's probably like yeah. I mean, our goal is to is to have major improvements with this. Our goal is to collect data, use the data. We use data now to, to improve systems. We've used data now to improve programs. Um, everything we can do as far as get a tool that helps us improve that process, which is take data from clients and users, use that to inform decisions, make better decisions and deliver better programs, and then repeat. Every tool that exists, we're gonna use that you know, to the best of our ability that we can to make the product better. Yeah, future plans to make it the best product for the, for the user. Yeah. yeah. So it was a, it's a great series of questions. I think just a bit like too high level and too big uh, for like a QA like this. Um, but that was it. That was all 15 or 16 of them. I think I lost count at some point. Um, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for submitting the questions. And we will catch you all on next week's episode of the Let's Ask My Good Son episode. I guess it's just a segment. It's a weekly segment. It's now. just a weekly segment now. So we'll catch you all next week on the Let's Ask Max segment.